coming to scenario one this is a nine year old girl with difficulty in near vision for the past two years she was initially two years ago assessed by an ophthalmologist and was diagnosed to have a simple myopia and was prescribed corrective spectacles for the past three months despite wearing spectacles after her school classes resumed she started having blurring of vision difficulty in focusing on the screen and headache every time she sits in front of a screen when we questioned her closely we found that it was more the problem related to the right eye so there was no history of pain in the eye or watering of the eye there was no history of redness or photophobia there was no history of white reflex or opacity noticed by the parents there was no history of recent onset squinting or any constitutional symptoms like fever or weight loss or rash there has been no past history of trauma no history of tuberculous contact so basically she is a 9 year old girl who has already had myopia who for the past 2 months has been having unilateral progressive painless loss of vision so when we have a painless loss of vision we go in an anatomical manner from the anterior chamber to the posterior chamber simplest explanation probably because of increase eye strain her refractory asset is worsening second possibility is a cataract or an uveitis the third is the vitreous pathology and then an increase in intraocular pressure going posteriorly it could be a retinal problem or a retrobulbar pathology so we had asked for an ophthalmologist to reevaluate the child for the present complaints and what we saw on indirect ophthalmoscopy was this typical appearance of snow banking which is very strongly a pointer of choroidal pathology so she was having basically peripheral uveitis as a cause for her progressive painless loss of vision so whenever we have uveitis in pediatrics we divide them into infective and inflammatory causes juvenile idiopathic arthritis sarcoidosis sympathizing ophthalmitis bechet's disease these are the commoner causes we think of when we have a uveitis so accordingly the uveitis workup was proceeded by by the ophthalmologist they had done the counts the esr the calcium the as levels a chest radiogram an ana an anti extractable nuclear antigen sets profile and she was referred to us to rule out sarcoidosis because the only thing that was strikingly abnormal about this child's investigation was the raised ac we know that ac can be elevated in sarcoidosis but in the absence of any other symptom involvement i was not very convinced that we are dealing with a connective tissue disorder and we proceeded to do a mon2 and to a surprise we found a strongly reactive mon2 32 to 22 mm but this was only a supportive evidence so we decided with the consent of the ophthalmologist to start the child on treatment for att along with intraocular steroids on the picture on the left hand side you have the indirect ophthalmoscopy at the beginning of therapy and on the right side you are seeing so much of clearing of the vitreous pathology within 2 months of starting att so this was a child who had a simple myopia recently complicated by unilateral posterior tuberculous uveitis how common does to be occur in the posterior chamber or in the eye i was surprised to read this article from pg chandigarh where they have described a huge series of such affected children i have given the references for you in case you are interested data from shankar netralaya chennai also show that nearly 20% of the pediatric uveitis patients are actually tuberculous in etiology so friends every time the ac levels are elevated please don't think of connective tissue disorder always think of simple treatable causes like mycobacterial infections going on to scenario 2 this is a 19 month old girl who came to our hospital with acute onset of right side weakness following a very trivial fall the weakness was maximum at onset there was no fever there was no vomiting there was no alteration in sensorium or seizures to suggest an intracranial bleed or an intracranial infection there was no past history suggestive of cyanotic spells recurrent respiratory tract infections failure to thrive or recurrent rta to suggest a cyanotic congenital heart disease there was no cyanosis or failure to thrive noticed by the parents no history of delayed milestones and the parents have not noticed any hand preference all other events were normal and the only unusual finding we found on the was she lives virtually on milk and hardly takes any other solids so this is the presentation on clinical examination we found the child was well grown apart from features of pallor and right upper motor neuron type of cranial nerve palsy and a hemiparesis you can see the weakness on the right side in this picture this was the only finding that we could see 
there were no neurocutaneous markers, no cerebral signs or signs of raised intracranial pressure. So proceeding to investigate this child, we were not surprised to see features consistent with iron deficiency anemia in the form of increased RDW, high TABC. Peripheral smear was also consistent. We did not see any abnormal cells or sickle cells, and probably there was no occult GA blood loss to account for the anemia. They had had a CT scan done elsewhere, so we completed the study for a pediatric RTD ischemic stroke with an MRI. And as you can see in this picture, there has been a recent onset of infarction. There is a ganglio-capsular infarct involving the left lenticulostriate vessels. Why would it, such a severe trivial injury cause so much of problem in a baby who is otherwise well with only risk factor being iron deficiency anemia? So this child had had a CT done elsewhere and that is what we wanted to review. We quickly went through the other possibilities for a pediatric arterial ischemic stroke and we found absolutely nothing in the stroke workup. The anti-nuclear antibodies, the MAN2, the anti-phospholipid antibodies, PTPTT, ECHO, everything was normal. So when we went through that old CT scan that they had done at the Reflink Center, we saw the infarct on the left ganglio capsular, but we were also surprised to see bilateral basal ganglia calcification. Now, why would a child with a left arterial ischemic stroke have bilateral basal ganglia calcification? We went through some more literature and requested our radiology colleagues to reconstruct coronal cuts to see whether there was something else which could explain this bilateral basal ganglia calcification. And friends, we were surprised to see this entity, which has been recently described in the literature. You can see here bilateral calcification of the lenticulostriate vessels. And this is consistent with a picture of a mineralizing angiopathy. We were quite surprised to know that such an entity exists. But when we actually went through the literature, we found so many case series from India describing this. It, almost exactly what we saw was also described by other workers. So this was a child who had iron deficiency anemia and mineralizing angiopathy as a cause for her severe acute onset stroke following such a trivial fall. Going on quickly to case scenario three, we have a four-month-old girl who was seen by us with history of failure to thrive, feeding difficulty, progressive pallor for a month. She had been born of a non-consanguinous marriage and her other elder sibling is doing well. Of late, she has also had fever and breathlessness. There has been no history of recurrent RTA, delayed meconium passage, diarrhea, ear discharge to suggest a congenital immunodeficiency. There has been no past history of fever, vomiting, polyuria, or history of rashes or history suggestive of a congenital heart disease. There has been no contact with tuberculosis. We can see from her anthropometry that she's failing to thrive. There was a healthy BCG scar present. The only physical examination that was striking, apart from crepitations in almost all the lung fields, was a striking spleen or hepatomegaly with 11 centimeter firm spleen. There was no history suggestive of chronic liver disease. And when we proceeded to investigate her, we found that she had pancytopenia. We also investigated with the bone marrow because she has organomegaly. At this point of time, our differential diagnosis was possibly thalassemia, an intrauterine infection, osteopetrosis, or some other lysosomal storage disorder. You can see from the X-ray that she has a really big spleen, and you can also she has right upper zone infiltrates with bilateral patchy granular infiltrates as well. When we did the bone marrow, we saw Gaucher cells. Right. So how could we explain the crepitations and the fever and breathlessness? We also had done GL for AB because of the failure to thrive, and we know that tuberculosis can affect the bone marrow. And lo and behold, we also saw acid fast bacilli in the GL. Right. So, is it possible that Gaucher's disease is affecting the bone marrow and producing this picture of pseudo tuberculosis? Or does Gaucher's have any association with tuberculosis? We quickly established the diagnosis of Gaucher's by the relevant enzyme. Dr. Sharad Balaji, my close friend, a very learned person, young and dynamic person, said that it's possible that because of the lysosomal storage disorder, the abnormal glucose cerebrosite gets into the macrophage and prevents the macrophage from effectively combating mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, this was a theoretical point. Sharad is seldom wrong. So when I went and did the literature search, somebody has actually done a study detailing all the immunological dysfunctions and it is well described that macrophage dysfunction occurs in Gaucher's. And so our child had Gaucher's disease as well as disseminated tuberculosis. 
I can already hear the audience muttering, but I'm not going to leave you without presenting the other three cases. Please bear with me. Going on to scenario four, this is a three-year-old girl child who was brought to our clinical attention for failure to thrive starting at around two years of age. She had already been seen by an endocrinologist who had found elevated TSH and low T4 with delayed bone age. So there was absolutely no doubt about her hypothyroidism. She had a newborn screening which was normal, therefore it was very unlikely to be congenital hypothyroidism. We could not see any absence of thyroid tissue or ectopic thyroid. And to prove that it was autoimmune thyroid, we also had elevated anti-TPO antibodies. So definitely this child has got Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She was started on replacement thyroxine and advised periodic follow. But to our dismay, despite optimal control of hypothyroidism, this child was just not growing enough. So what are the causes? Is it nutritional? Is it that this child has got other hormone deficiencies in addition to Hashimoto's? Is there ongoing malabsorption or systemic disease? The investigations did not suggest any clues either on clinical or on lab investigation. So when in doubt, I make it a policy to always screen for celiac and we were absolutely surprised to see this high, sky high levels of tissue transglutaminase. We proceeded to do a biopsy and confirmed that the child has got celiac disease. So the point is when you have one autoimmune disease, always look for another autoimmune disease. This is the only literature from India that I could find to suggest that yes, nearly eight to 10% of this cohort of patients who had been seen in Nair Hospital Bombay, they took nearly 260 people with autoimmune thyroids and screened them for celiac disease. And nearly eight to 10% of these people were also positive for celiac antibodies. So this child had double trouble in the form of autoimmune hypothyroidism and celiac disease. The moment we put her on a gluten-free diet, the thyroxine started working like a charm. Going on to case scenario five, this is a 13 year old girl who came with abdominal pain and vomiting of three days duration with high colored urine and nausea. The pain was continuous and it was all over the abdomen. The vomiting was non-bilious. She has been not in contact with any known patient of jaundice. She has not been exposed to either convention or alternative medicines. She has been fully vaccinated for all childhood diseases, including HBV and HAV. There has been no recent neurological deterioration and no history of exposure to Siddha or Ayurvedic medicines. She was a very well thriving child. The only physical finding we could see on the examination was ictris and absolutely nothing else, no carefree, no signs of a reduced liver span. So the possibilities was an acute intravascular hemolysis, but that could not explain the vomiting and the abdominal pain, cholelithiasis, cholangitis, acute hepatitis, and Wilson's in that order. When we proceeded to investigate, we were absolutely surprised to see that she had normal liver function tests except for an elevated bilirubin with a direct fraction which was elevated. No SGOT, SGPT, no PT, PTT prolongation. So this was not a hepatocellular jaundice. So we proceeded to look at the Guillory tract and we saw a dilated common bile duct. But what more we saw was surprising. We also saw evidence of left psoas abscess which was confirmed on MRI. I've given in this picture, you can see that huge mass of portahepatic node, which is compressing the common bile duct. You can also see the left psoas abscess. When we trapped the psoas abscess and sent it, we were absolutely flabbergasted to see that it was mycobacterium tuberculosis positive, and the child did absolutely well with ATP. So this child had two intra-abdominal manifestations of mycobacterium tuberculosis with only a three-day history and absolutely no constitutional symptom. And remember, left psoas abscess, right psoas abscess, bilateral psoas abscess following pot spine is well described. But this was a child whose MRI showed absolutely nothing wrong with the spinal cord or the spinal column. The only evidence or the only other literature that I could see of this similar picture was from an Omanian lady who was 39 years of age who had tuberculosis of the lymph node mimicking an obstructive jaundice or a carcinoma head of pancreas. Coming to my last case scenario, this is a seven-year-old boy who came with multiple joint pains and swelling of six months duration and an acute history of fever, low grade, with headache, altered sensorium, seizures and vomiting of two days. Prior to six months, he has been absolutely normal. When he started having non-migratory, small joint and large joint arthritis with painful limitation of movements, redness and swelling, which was often associated with fever. There was no history suggestive of rheumatic fever, skin rash, hematuria, 
eye redness, anemia or skin nodules or dysentery, no past history of urinary infection or weight loss. He has been on multinary disciplinary treatment. He has been treated with injections, NSAIDs, steroids, Ayurveda, Pati Vedya, which is Ayurveda, you name it, he had received it. When he came to us, the only thing that we could see out of the ordinary was hypertension on all the four limbs. We could see evidence of arthritis in the right elbow and the left knee joints, and there was no features of cranial irritation. So arthritis, fever, static weight, two to six months history of on and off peripheral small and joint points with new onset C in the symptoms. So the first thing that we could think of as SLE vasculitis, we also thought of other vasculitis like microscopic polyangitis or Takayasu, intracranial infection complicating a rheumatic illness, hematoreticular malignancies we know are master mimics, JA, sickle cell disease, or one of the periodic fever syndromes. When we proceeded to investigate, we found that he had anemia of chronic inflammation in the form of low MCB, low MCH, low hemoglobin, along with high ferritin and total N-binding capacity. The smear was negative for atypical cells and sickle cells. Platelet counts was normal, making SLE less likely. There was definitely ongoing inflammation in the form of elevated ESR. Surprisingly, all the workup for vasculitis that we could do think of were normal. A 2D echo was also negative for infective endocarditis. Meanwhile, we screened him for UEATIS and the MRI was suggestive of a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, secondary to hypertension. So we stabilized him with anti-epileptic drugs, anti-hypertensives, and because we didn't any get clues from the vasculitic workup, we turned our attention to the renovascular hypertension, endocrine causes, and did blood gas analysis, urine analysis, and really investigated the kidney and the renal vessels, and we found nothing. While he was in the ICU, the one striking thing was he was consistently having polyuria. So we tried, turned our attention to the sugars, electrolytes, and osmolarity, and that is where we got our clue. We found a calcium of 14 milligram per deciliter with a phosphorus of 5.5 with normal alkaline phosphatase. We stabilized his hypercalcemia with IV steroids and furosemide. It took us nearly two weeks to get his calcium down. And when we were investigating for hypercalcemia, we were the first thing that we think of as hyperparathyroidism, which was absolutely normal in this child. When we investigated him further to look for vitamin D elevation, we were absolutely stunned to see these sky high levels of vitamin D. When we went through his old prescriptions, we found that those injections that he were getting were actually arachetol injections. So this child has been systematically overdosed on vitamin D, producing systemic hypercalcemia with CNS manifestations. And once hypercalcemia settled down, we were able to make a diagnosis of polyarticular JA and initiate appropriate therapy. This is a classical example when we have vitamin supplementation for vitamin D, Alavukka Mirinal, Amrudam Nanji. This is a lovely reference article that I would recommend interested people to read. This gives in detail the manifestations as well as the scenarios in which vitamin D intoxication occurs. Thank you all for your patient listening. We are not